What if I told you there was a race of people that lived in Northern Africa, India, and in small pockets in between that had human bodies but the heads of dogs? No, I'm not making this up. These were real half-dog, half-human hybrids that were encountered by people such as Christopher Columbus and Marco Polo. Some modern scholars believe there wasn't really a race of dog-headed people, but the term was actually a derogatory description of someone who was ugly or barbaric. Today, let's look at the legend of the Cynophilus people and see what we can find. Spoiler alert, I'm going to butcher pronouncing these names, so just bear with me and we'll get through this together. Cynophilus was a race of people that had the heads of dogs, and they appear in many texts from 400 BC all the way up until modern day. The first mention is from 400 BC, when the Greek physician wrote a passage about the tribes of Cynophilus. They speak no language, but bark like dogs, and in this manner make themselves understood by each other. Their teeth are larger than those of dogs, their nails like those of animals, but longer and rounder. They inhabit the mountains as far as the river Indus. Their complexion is swarthy. They are extremely just, like the rest of the Indians with whom they associate. They understand the Indian language, but are unable to converse only barking or in making signs with their hands and fingers by the way of reply. They live on raw meat. They number about 120,000. The Cynophili living on the mountains do not practice any trade, but live by hunting. When they have killed an animal, they roast it in the sun. They also rear numbers of sheep, goats, and asses, drinking the milk of the sheep and where they made it from. They eat the fruits of the Sephora, whence amber is procured since it is sweet. They also dry it and keep it in baskets, as the Greeks keep their dried grapes. They make rafts, which they load with this fruit together, with well-cleaned purple flowers and 260 talents of amber, with the same quantity of the purple dye, and 1,000 additional talents of amber, which they send annually to the king of India. They exchange the rest for bread, flour, and cotton stuffs with the Indians, from who they also buy swords for hunting, wild beasts bows and arrows, being very skillful in drawing the bow and hunting the spear. They cannot be defeated in war since they inhabit lofty and inaccessible mountains. Every five years the king sends them a present of 300,000 bows, as many spears, 120,000 shields, and 50,000 swords. They do not live in houses but in caves. They set out for the chase with bows and spears, and as they are very swift of foot, they pursue and soon overtake their enemy. The women have a bath once a month, the men do not have a bath at all, but they do wash their hands. They anoint themselves three times a month with oil made from milk and wipe themselves with skins. The clothes of men and women alike are not skins with the hair on, but skins tan and very fine. The richest wear linen clothes, but they are very few in number. They have no beds, but sleep on leaves or grass. He who possesses the greatest number of sheep is considered the richest, and so in regard to their other possessions. Ali, both men and women, have tails above their hips, like dogs, but longer and more hairy. They are just and live longer than any other men, 170, sometimes 200 years of age. They were known to be fierce warriors who rarely traded with humans, but there were some groups of people they trusted. The most famous description is from Marco Polo during his trip to the island of Angamanian. Angamanian is a very large island. The people are without a king and are idolaters and no better than wild beasts. And I'm sure you all the men of this island of Angamanian have heads like dogs and teeth and eyes likewise. In fact, in the face they are all just like big mastiff dogs. They have a quantity of spices, but they are a most cruel generation, and eat everybody that they can catch, if not of their own race. There is also an account of a group of these people living in China. A Buddhist missionary wrote about encountering dog-headed men on the island to the east of Fusang. The most famous Cynophilus to have ever lived is St. Christopher. St. Christopher is said to have been searching for Christ so he could serve him as a follower when he came across a young boy who asked him to take him across the river. As he took the child across the river, the river rose, and once they made it across, the child revealed that he was Christ and then suddenly vanished. Another version of this story mentions that he eventually met Jesus Christ and learned the error of his former ways. He repented and became baptized and eventually received sainthood and the gift of a human appearance. It's interesting to know that many historical paintings of St. Christopher show him with the head of a dog. So whatever happened to the dog-headed people that once populated pockets of Europe, Africa, India, and Asia? 
Some people believe that as other empires grew, the Sinophilus people were hunted to extinction or they went underground and still remain there to this day. Some scholars believe that these explorers and writers were mistaking baboons and other animals for being half-human, half-dog hybrids. Personally, I find this unlikely because these people seem to communicate and display many human characteristics that seem far more advanced than baboons and other ape species. Still to this day, there are sightings all over the world of dogmen or creatures with the heads of dogs that are very aggressive. Could these be modern descendants of Sinophilus? We may never know the true story of who these tribes were, but their stories will continue to capture our imaginations forever. Thank you all for tuning in to this video. Hope you all enjoyed it. Leave your thoughts in the comments section below. Don't forget to leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Also share it with your friends and be sure to subscribe. Have a great day everyone.